السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His entire household, all his companions May Allah bless them all and bless every single one of us Amin. My brothers and sisters if we take a look at Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, these two were both stabbed and they were both stabbed in Salatul Fajr and that is how they were both martyred. However, sometimes if we are not concentrating, we might swap the names of those who had stabbed either one of them. So just a clarification because it was brought to my notice that yesterday with a slip of the tongue, Instead of saying Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi had stabbed Umar ibn al-Khattab, I think I said Abdurrahman ibn Muljim. Abdurrahman ibn Muljim had stabbed Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi had stabbed Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. So it was just a clarification that I needed to make, although it was quite clear that it was just a slip of the tongue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the concentration that is needed, inshaAllah. But this evening we have a beautiful lesson. Because tonight we will be discussing some of the female companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I'm sure a lot of us would know that we have so many of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and at the same time they are both male and female, and they are our heroes and heroines. So we need to learn lesson from both. It is just that we've been speaking about the males. There is a little bit more that we find in the more common books regarding the Sahaba from amongst the males. But it's about time we dug out the lives of those heroines of ours and learnt lesson because there are great lessons. So no specific order. We are just making mention of them. And inshallah, we will ask Allah to accept from us the lessons that we are learning. The first person we've chosen to speak about is a Sahabiya, a very great companion of Muhammad wasallam, who was so fortunate that her father was a companion, her grandfather was a companion, meaning Sahabi, her husband was a companion, her sister was a companion, or her family, her siblings, companions, as well as her children, subhanallah. So who was this? Asma binti Abi Bakr, as Siddiq radiallahu anha. What a great woman, subhanallah. She was the daughter of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anha. When she was young, Abu Jahl, entered the home. She was 10 years older than Aisha radiallahu anha. They had accepted Islam close to the beginning with the, her father. They had accepted Islam, the top 20 from amongst those who turned to Islam or who accepted the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because obviously Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to so many people from amongst them, his own family, and they turned with him. So one day Abu Jahl knocked at the door he was looking for Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an. And when she opened the door, he asked, Where is your father? You know, very angry, very upset. Where is your father? So she says, He's not here right now. And he gave her one slap across her face out of anger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her goodness. Really, Allah has written for her so much goodness. We will hear in a few moments some of what happened in the life of this great Sahabiyyah. But that was at a young age. She served Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much so that upon the hijrah of her father and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we know that the two were together, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they needed some food when they had already left and they were out in the cave and so on. And who brought them the food? It was Asma binti Abi Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. She did not have anything to carry the food and the water. So she tore part of her clothing and made it into two pouches, or should we say a holding belt. You know the belt which the women tie? So it was known in the Arabic language as a nitaq. So she came with these belts and in it the food was disguised and tied obviously. And she had come and presented it. So the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for her, prayed for her and said, May Allah replace these two holding pouches that you have brought with two from paradise. 
So she was known as Dhatun Nitaqain, the one with the two holding belts. She had torn her own clothing in order to tie it and to put the, the food and the drink for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and her own father, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was asked, who do you love the most? He was asked this question a few times. Who do you love the most ever? He says, Aisha, subhanallah, Aisha radiallahu anha. Then who next? He says, her father, which means Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha. So this was a sister belonging to the same man, but she was the half sister of Aisha. The mothers were different. Asma binti Abi Bakr, her mother was Qutayla. Ibn binti Abdul Uzza. And as for Aisha radiallahu anha, her mother was Umm Ruman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a little bit of the goodness and the good fortune that these people have had. So she was one of those who was married to a man who had absolutely nothing. He proposed earlier on and the father looked, saw him to be responsible and saw that he owned nothing. The only thing he had was a horse, one horse. That's it. Subhanallah. So what to do? Get him married or not? Straight away, the father says, this is a good man. We get you married. He got his daughter, Asma binti Abi Bakr, married to Az Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwailid. So with this, she became related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Who? Asma binti Abi Bakr. Because al-Awwam ibn Khuwailid was this, the brother of Khadija binti Khuwailid, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they were interrelated in so many different ways, subhanallah. So when they got married, she says, my husband had nothing, absolutely nothing. But I was the happiest person because he looked after me so well. My brothers and sisters, let's take a lesson from this. It has nothing to do with what you have. It has to do with how you look after your spouse. Would you rather be a wife of a very wealthy man who swears you every day and treats you like dirt? Or would you rather be the wife of a person who might not have much in this world, but he treats you well? May Allah grant us as fathers also and brothers an understanding of where and how to assist our daughters and sisters to get married. So she says, we were so happy. I used to go out to take this horse and I used to make it, you know, eat. I used to prepare the hay and whatever fodder for the horse. And I used to make sure that the horse is well fed. And at the same time, I used to go out and fetch the water, carry it on my head. And I used to go to the plot of land that, uh, that my husband had. And I worked and I used to go and help cultivate and whatnot and get the seeds of the dates and crush them. And I used to cook and I used to try my best to cook, subhanallah, as I could. But my husband never complained about my food. She says, I used to make the dough, you know, something very interesting. And this, she mentions it later on, because when they came to Medina Munawwara, that is when obviously... The, the Muslimin had a little bit more. In Makkah, they had very, very little, subhanallah. But in Medina Munawwara, after some time, they began to get a bit more. So she says, I used to make the dough, but I was not good at preparing the bread. You know, today we would call it roti or chapati, something, something of that nature. I was not good at that. So my neighbors used to help me to make it, subhanallah. Amazing, amazing. You know, sometimes women can be brilliant in everything, but there will be one thing or two things that they might not be good at. Her husband appreciated everything else. I think with us, we have a habit of picking on one or two things that are negative and all the positives are forgotten. We need to go back to Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu and learn about Asma binti Abi Bakr. She actually says her husband was this and this. She mentions brilliant things. How many of us, our wives, would be able to say really good things about us? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those. No complaint about food. They lived not for food. Unlike us, whole day the woman is in the kitchen. Still, when we come back in the evening, we have a complaint about the salt. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us ease. Remember this. So this was Asma binti Abi Bakr. They say food was not an issue. Whatever was there, they ate. Because they, did, they ate in order to live. They did not live in order to eat. With us, if the food is not decorated properly, we get upset. So forget about the taste. It needs to look so good, we need to take a picture of it and put it on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. That's the problem we have today. Everything we eat, the world must know. They've seen it, they haven't tasted it. So the decoration is more important than the taste. Allahu Akbar. Believe me, if we do have 
One day, technology to put in a taste, we would let the world taste. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Really, we've indulged so much that sometimes your belly is aching. You don't realize it's because of the evil eye through the pictures of your food before you ate it that you put across the globe. People who don't have food are seeing that. And they're thinking you're living a real queen's life and a king's life. Yet what we do on the internet is we Photoshop our lives and we just put something that is even better than a reality that we're living. And so everybody looks at it and says, wow, you live like a queen. Yet we are so upset in our own lives. Contentment is not achieved by showing off what you don't really have. And even by showing off what you have. Contentment is achieved by thanking Allah for whatever he's given you and working hard upon your family and your offspring. So Asma binti Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, she was such a beautiful woman, so good in her character. She was so matured. It is reported that her children were known completely that these are the children of Asma binti Abi Bakr, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam, subhanallah. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam's children, they were known. And they all used to say, this is the upbringing of Asma, subhanallah. She brought them up. She worked hard. They were heroes. She saw her father become khalif subhanallah and she saw her son become khalif we spoke about abdullah ibn zubair ibn al-awwam radiallahu an how they pledged allegiance to him the bulk of the ummah and he was based in makkah al mukarramah this is her, his mother subhanallah she saw that so look there were khalifs from amongst the family and she was such a woman humble down to earth so subhanallah it is reported that Asma binti Abi Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha, she was very generous. So generous that she did not keep anything with her. She gave it away. No extra, no excess. So her son Abdullah ibn Zubair says that, you know, my mother and my aunt Aisha, they were very generous, both of them. But there was a subtle difference between the two. What was the difference? Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to collect things and when it became a little bit more, she would then distribute it and give it. But my mother never collected. As soon as it came, she gave it. So they both gave, but this was a subtle difference. So Asma binti Abi Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha, she used to believe firmly and tell the people, do not wait for excess in order to give a charity because you're never going to get the excess. But give from what you have and it will bring about excess. Subhanallah. Give what you have. Don't wait. You know, when I'm rich, I'm going to give a charity. Give a charity now. When she used to get sick, radiallahu anha, when she was ill, she used to give charities and she used to free her slaves, you know, because she was ill. And the Sahaba or the Tabi'een later on used to say, do you know what? We were taught. Now this is not a hadith, but it's a teaching that cure yourself by being charitable. Give out a charity. You are sick, give something. Give a charitable thing. Perhaps Allah might cure you due to the good deed you've done. Asma binti Abi Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha used to be a firm believer of this. So much so that when she was sick, even the slaves became happy. They used to know, hey, we're starting to become freed here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and cure us of our sicknesses. Make us charitable at least with our tongues. Sometimes when we are sick, we are rude. Not realizing that a charity can actually be with the same tongue. So it would be reverse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. She was a woman who was known as very charitable. And at the same time, she did not like to accept charities. Or should I say, not charities. She did not like to accept gifts from those who were not yet Muslim. Subhanallah. So her grandfather, the father of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, his name was Abu Quhafa. When Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the hijrah and she was still in, Madi in Mecca and she was quite young at the time, the, the grandfather walks in and he said, did your father leave anything for you? Now he was blind. So she quickly put some sand and a few stones into a bag. And because he was blind, she says, yes, he's left a lot for us. He's left a lot. What has he left? So she took his hand. That was the grandfather. She took the hand and she put it on this bag. They used to keep, you know, wealth in a certain type of a pouch. So the pouch was there. It was now full of sand and stone. So when, when he felt it, he said, oh, then it's okay. Then that means he's looked after you. And then he went away. But she did not want to take his money because he would have been spending on them. And she says, no, I want clean, pure wealth that has been earned in the correct way. Subhanallah. So much so that one day in Medina Munawwara, Qutayla, who was her mother, 
This mother was divorced by Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu some time back in the period of ignorance. And she visited Medina. She wanted to come to her daughter and she brought a gift for her daughter. The daughter says, I won't take it from you. So the mother was hurt because she was not a believer. So they went to Rasulullah. No, she spoke to Aisha radiallahu anha who was her sister. I want you to ask the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this is the gift. What should I do? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين Allah does not stop you from being kind, good and just to those who from the non-Muslims who have not harmed you. They have done nothing to you. They have not driven you out of your homes. They have not stolen your property. You must be kind and just whether they are Muslim or not. Allah loves those who are just. So you can take the gift, subhanallah. So she treated her mother well and then she allowed her mother to stay there. Otherwise she was even saying, mom, you're not going to stay by mine. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson and may he purify us in every single way. So she was a woman who, who witnessed the battle of Yarmouk. She witnessed this battle with her son and her husband. And she was from amongst those who assisted morally. See, the women used to participate in the battles, but not fighting. They would participate in order to boost the morale of their own men and in order to look after them if they were injured and so on. This was happening from the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So many women from amongst the Sahaba had taken part or had witnessed the battles starting from Uhud and Badr and so on. And subhanallah, they were from amongst those who assisted in a very great way, not only through dua, but on top of that, through the moral support that they gave and through also looking after those who were injured and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a lesson. She was a woman who used to be used as an example when it came to happiness in marriage because she adjusted her life entirely to suit the life of her husband. Remember, we said he had nothing when they got married. Do you know what happened? After the hijrah and after the victory of Mecca and so on, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam ibn Khuwailid became one of the richest of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. So wealthy, so wealthy. But look, when he started off, what happened? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah An-Nur regarding marriage to, to those who are poor and regarding promoting marriage to those who might not have so much wealth. Allah says, <laughs> If they are poor, they have everything else. They are good people. They have character. They have deen. They have conduct and all that. But they don't have wealth. Allah says, Allah will grant them from his, himself, make them independent through his virtue. So don't worry about wealth. They will come up with their own wealth as a couple. Their sustenance will open up because they have come together. Subhanallah. But with us, I think we are still so weak. We still, like I said, as days are passing, we're looking for wealth. And in such a way, my daughter must be very comfortable. She needs a home here and she needs another holiday home in Lankawi. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us ease. May Allah grant us good holidays. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. You know, for us, mashallah, a holiday is not something wrong, but it becomes wrong if we forget Allah. And that's what we think a holiday is. So if you go out and you're going to visit a place or a land, your salah comes first. Don't forget your dress code. Don't forget halal and haram. Don't forget that you're a Muslim. Then it's fine. But if we go and drown ourselves in everything, forgetting Allah, what holiday is that worth? May Allah forgive us. So this was the woman. She lived many, many years. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an used to give 1,000 coins to the, to the great sahabiyat, the women from amongst the sahaba. And she was one of them who used to get. She used to give it out almost instantaneously. She used to give it out again in charities. Something very important to, be, to make mention of, she used to interpret dreams. She lived very, very long. She lived in Mecca to Mukarramah when her son was the Khalif. Do you know how old she was? 100 years old. Subhanallah. She was the last from amongst those who made hijrah to pass away. So if you hear about hijrah, the last person to make hijrah, which means that group of Muslims, 
She was the last from amongst them. The men had all gone. She was the last one to go. She passed away the 73rd year after Hijrah when she was 100 years old. She had not lost a single tooth and she, she was completely sane. She was not, you know, senile and so on. And the, the companions or should I say the tabi'een, those who followed, they used to say that we learnt that those who do not sin in their young age, when they grow old, Allah does not test them with senility and Allah does not test them with, you know, old age that you, you are now in total need of someone else. Although that is not a hadith, but that's what they used to say in order to encourage the youngsters to remain steadfast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to stay steadfast. So her son was martyred in front of her by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. We spoke about it the other day. And she had a few heavy words for Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. She passed away approximately two weeks after that. May Allah grant her Jannah. The next heroine of ours tonight, subhanallah, a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it did not stop there. She became known as the mother of the believers, subhanallah. Who gets the status of mother of the believers? One who was married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She gets the status of the mother of the believers. No one is allowed to marry a woman the minute she was married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But before that, she could have been married to whoever else, subhanallah. So let's take a look at the story of Ummu Salama. She was known as Ummu Salama, but that was not her name. She had a child called Salama, so she was known as the mother of Salama. Radiyallahu anha. Her name was Hind binti Abi Umayyah, the daughter of Abu Umayyah. And she was from the Bani Makhzum clan of Quraysh, Mecca. She married a man known as Abu Salama, obviously because he was the father of Salama. She was the mother of Salama. Easy. They used to call him the son Salama ibn Abi Salama. Wow. Have you ever thought of what that means? Salama, the son of the father of Salama. Subhanallah. So you really don't know the, the father's name. So let's, let's, un, let's try and uh, look at who the father was. His name was Abdullah ibn Abdul Asad. He was a nobleman. They accepted Islam very early. It is reported that they were amongst the top 10 to accept Islam. The two of them. They accepted Islam together. This man, Abdullah ibn Abdul, ibn Abdul Asad, and late known as Abu Salama and Ummu Salama, whose name was Hind binti Abi Umayyah, radiyallahu anha. So when they had accepted Islam, Quraysh started harming them. And obviously they were from Quraysh. One was from Bani Abdul Asad, that was Abdullah ibn Abdul Asad. And this, uh, uh, this mother of the believers, radiyallahu anha, she was from Bani Makhzum. They started harassing them, troubling them so much so that when the Migration to Africa had started. Muhammad sallallahu allowed them to go. These were from amongst the first who left. The couple. They went and they arrived in Africa. So when Umm Salama, Abu Salama, they arrived in Africa, radiallahu anhuma, with some of the other companions, they stayed there for a while and they lived very peacefully under an Najashi as Muslims. But they missed Mecca. They really missed Muhammad sallallahu and the other companions. They wanted to learn more. They wanted to be a part of the growth of Islam. So when Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma accepted Islam, news went to Africa that now Islam has taken over in Mecca and everything is good. They've got power and strength. So these people said, well, then let's go back. So they started coming back and they came back. When they came back, they found, yes, it was true that uh, uh, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma accepted Islam. But it was not true that we were all now safe and secure. In fact, the harm started once again. There was calm for a while and then the war began once again. So they were harmed again. So the Prophet ﷺ then permitted his companions to leave for Medina Munawwara for the Hijrah. And from amongst the first to leave, Abu Salama, Umm Salama, and the child Salama, radiallahu anhum jami'an. So what did Abu Salama do? Wallahi, if you look at the history of these three or this family they were very loving another story similar to the previous one we've just heard people used to give an example of the love of these subhanallah loving in the sense that taking care of his wife that is what love is love is not a statement i love you i love you we might never have heard the oldies say i love you as often as the young ones do but trust me they perhaps loved their spouses more than the young ones allah knows best 
it goes to show that sometimes we've made our lives a show. You know, we want to walk hand in hand. And yet we don't get along. We don't want to solve our problems. But the world must see that at one Utama mall, we must look like a happy couple. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive us. More important than that is to really be a happy couple. May Allah make it easy for us. So Abu Salama says, let me prepare a, an animal for my wife. And you know, he prepared it, the, the camel for himself, his family, and he helped his wife and so on. They got onto the camel and they started leaving Mecca, the first from amongst those who were leaving for Hijrah, from amongst the first. We already had Musab ibn Umair and, and you know, they had left. But this family, subhanallah, they were from amongst those who were right at the beginning. But something sad happened, very sad. As they were leaving, some people from Bani Makhzum, the tribe of Umm Salama, saw them leave. So they rushed to them and they stopped them because they were stopping people from going. They said, we don't want you to go. Now Abu Salama says, you have no right over me. They said, yes, but this daughter is a daughter of our clan. She's our daughter. We will never allow her to go with you. So Umm Salama says, but I want to go with him. No, you won't be allowed. So they grabbed her, they snatched her, they took her, they pulled her, they dragged her. And Abu Salama was helpless because there was a group of people on one hand and he's the only man on the other. And they took her away. And just as they are taking her away, Bani Abdul Asad, who, the, who is the clan of this man, Umm Abu Salama, they see the child Salama going with Bani Makhzum and the mother. They say, no, that child belongs to our clan because the father is from us. So they said, we're going to take him. And the people of Bani Makhzum did not argue with that. They said, okay, take the child. And here is Umm Salama crying for her child. Don't separate me from my child. As it is, you've separated me from my husband. Now you want to separate me from my son? It's the only thing I have, subhanallah. No, they did not listen. Separated three ways. So the husband had no option. He went to Madinatul Munawwara. The wife was with the people of Bani Makhzum. And the child, Salama, a little baby, now gone with the people of Bani Abdul Asad. So subhanallah, she says, I cried and cried, made dua, and I was lost. And I used to come out to the place where this whole thing happened every day. And I used to just cry and relive what was going on. She, she couldn't really eat properly. She couldn't think properly. She couldn't drink properly. And she says, I struggled and suffered. And days passed, months passed, and almost a year passed. And my condition deteriorated almost completely. Until one day, a man from amongst my cousins happened to see me and he felt sorry for me. So he spoke to my family very strongly. And he said, look, why don't you let this miskina, you know, this poor woman, let her join her husband. What has she done to you? So he managed to speak to them and convince them to now let her go to her husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite those who are separated from their husbands with them. I mean, for whatever reason, there are so many whom this happens to, but we don't realize. May Allah make it easy for you. I mean, so she was really touched but she said i can't leave why can you not leave what about my son he's now almost a year old or a year old so i can't leave without him i'm going to go to my husband but my child a piece of me is here so after some time someone else spoke to the to bani abdul asad and managed to convince them to release the child when they released the child she was the happiest woman ever immediately she got that same camel of hers she prepared it by feeding it well and getting a few things and she jumped onto the camel and she was going and subhanallah who was with her nobody a journey that took almost 16 days do you know that nowadays you go makkah to medina four hours that time if it was a rush and you had very good horses, you could get there in four days. If you had normal camels and they were men who moved very quickly, they would get there in eight days. But a journey with women and family members, 16 days. And you needed to know the way. And you would perhaps be waylaid by highwaymen. And so dangerous was the path. But she went all alone. She, was, she left Mecca to Mukarrama. Who? Just the two of them, her, her child and the animal. And they started going. Subhanallah. She says, I made a dua to Allah. Oh Allah, protect me. I'm going for a cause. I'm making the hijrah. I'm going to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and to my husband. And Ya Allah, you protect me. And as she got to Tan'im, the man responsible for the keeping of, or whose family was responsible for the keeping of the, the key of the Kaaba. This man, Uthman ibn Talha, radiallahu an, he saw her, he recognized her, and he remembered something. What did he remember? 
the father of Ummu Salama was known as Zadur Rakib. Zadur Rakib means the provisions of a rider. You know, when travelers used to come, if they came to Ummu Salama's father's house and his name was Abu Umayya ibn al Mughira, they did not used to bring any provision because he used to provide for them free on the house, so to speak. You know, normally when we're traveling on a journey, you're going perhaps to Penang or anywhere else. You know, there was a time when we used to take all our provisions before all these restaurants came into existence. But subhanallah, you would take lunch. Up to today, people might tell you, you know, take some lunch in case you need it. So we still do it. Even if it's a modern country. And even if sometimes you're traveling by air, some people want to give you, you know, certain things. And this is why sometimes typically you find people opening their lunch in the aircraft. And subhanallah, the aroma of those samosas really goes through the whole aircraft and everyone looks back at you and sees, hey, what's going on, you know? Subhanallah, once I witnessed some people actually offering the others, would you like some, you know? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Zadur Rakib was a man they knew. If you're going to him, you don't need anything, he will give it. So Uthman ibn Talha remembered this and she said, Oh, daughter of Zadur Rakib, where are you going? She says, I'm going to Medina. He says, you cannot go alone, I will take you. Subhanallah. Now, the journey occurred. He, he really looked after her with utmost respect. You know what she says? She says, Wallahi, Wallahi, the way he got me off and on the camel, day and night for all the days and the food and everything else, he would stop the camel, bring it down, walk away, wait for me to get off after a while, come back and then take the camel to the tree, tie it down, prepare a place for me to rest and then go away and then I would come back and rest there and he would rest at a different tree, different position. Later on, he would come back and you know, declare that he's coming by a little noise and then when I knew he's coming, I would get ready and so on and he would, he would then get the camel ready, walk away. I would then get onto the camel, then he would come back and take it again. Subhanallah. And he continued doing this. Whenever I needed to stop, he would stop. He would jump off his uh, camel. He would, get on, he would actually get my camel down and then walk away for me to jump off so that I'm not embarrassed in any way. So she says, Wallahi, I've never been in the company of a strange man. But I know this man, a man that his, the way he honored me and how modest he was is something that I would never see again. Subhanallah. Uthman ibn Talha radiallahu an. You know, just to, to stop for a moment, he is the man whom they had accepted Islam. He had accepted Islam with Khalid ibn al-Walid and with Amr ibn al-As. They came after Hudaybiya to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before Fath. And at the, at the time of the victory of Mecca, the key of the Kaaba was returned to Uthman ibn Talha, even though Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was one of those who was reluctant. He was telling, telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it is we quench the hujjaj with zamzam, why don't we keep the key as well? And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, call Uthman ibn Talha. Allah has instructed me to return the amana to whom it belongs to. It belongs to him. It will remain with him and his family up to the end of time to this day. The same family holds the key of the Kaaba. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. This strengthened Uthman ibn Talha. You know, some narrations say that he accepted Islam at that point. But the most correct narrations say he accepted Islam with Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an and Amr ibn al-As when they entered into the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Hudaybiya. So this was Uthman ibn Talha. We owe it to him because he looked after a woman who later became known as mother of the believers. So how did she become mother of the believers? Uthman ibn Talha arrived in Quba. And when he arrived in Quba, he looked at the area and he told her, okay, your husband is in this area. I leave you and you can now enter safely. And he turned away and went back to Makkah. Imagine making a 16-day journey just to drop a woman who doesn't even belong to your faith. Subhanallah. Look at this. And then now he's going back to Makkah al Mukarramah. What must have made him do it? Imagine the father had so good qualities that this man remembered the way the father honored all the people whom he knew and whom he didn't know. He was known as Zadur Rakib. So he says, the minimum I can do for his daughter is to honor her by taking her and I will come back. Subhanallah. So she went in, she was united with her husband and her, and her child and she later had many other children or a few other children. One was named Durrah, one was Zainab, the daughters and another son known as Umar. These were all the children of Salama, Abu Salama, the children of Abu Salama. So subhanallah, 
This man, they were so excited, so happy, and they lived a really happy life. He took part in the Battle of Badr, and he returned. So he's a Badri. Who? Abu Salama. He took part in the Battle of Uhud. He returned, but he returned injured. And he succumbed to his injuries at some stage. So she became a widow. Now, they got along so well that she said to herself, I won't be able to marry someone. Who can there be amongst the men better than Abu Salama? But at the deathbed of Abu Salama, the Prophet ﷺ visited him. And he made a dua. He was worried about his family. He was injured. And he was worried about his little children that he had and his widow that he was going to leave. So the Prophet ﷺ taught him a dua. Oh Allah, help me through my difficulty and replace it for me with something even better. You know when you have a problem? We make a dua. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufli khayram minha. Oh Allah, help me through my problem. Grant me something even better. So there was a dua similar to this that Muhammad ﷺ made him say. And he made a dua. Don't worry, Allah will take care of what you leave behind in an even better way. And subhanallah, he then passed away, but she refused to get married. So she, until she became known as Ayyimul Arab, which means the widow of the Arabs. Now that was an insult because at that time, at the time, the Arabians or the Arabs at the time, they would never leave a widow without getting married to her, someone getting married to her to look after her and her children. So they would not waste time. Unlike us, subhanallah, a widow is someone whom perhaps might have a bad reputation just like a divorcee. May Allah protect us. That is not true. Perhaps they are some of the best women from amongst us, but who knows? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make life easy for those who have suffered in either way. So this was Umm Salama radiallahu anha, Hind binti Abi Umayyah. She had a few proposals and she said, no, I've got children. I'm now old. I can't marry. And I'm very possessive because I was literally spoiled by my husband in the sense that he used to pamper her. He used to, you know, look after her, take so good care of her. She was worried that I might never get that again. And then I'm going to start comparing and things will happen. And I might say something to my husband that will make him upset. So subhanallah, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was from amongst those who proposed to marry her. She turned it down. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was amongst those who, who wanted to marry her, proposed. She turned it down. Subhanallah. Imagine Umar, Abu Bakr, Siddiq, radiallahu. How? She said, no, because now I'm old. I'm not just a little young girl, number one. Number two is I have kids. And number three is I'm quite possessive. So when she, the Prophet sallallahu later in the fourth year of Hijrah, proposed to marry her. And she said, you know, I have got three issues. One is I'm old. Two is I'm very possessive. And three is I've got children. So he says, as for your possessiveness, I make dua to Allah to help you overcome it. And you will, number one. Number two, as for your age, remember, I'm slightly older than you, subhanallah. And at number three, as for your children, they will be mine. I will take care of them, subhanallah. So she says, okay, she accepted the proposal, got married. Instead of being known as Ummu Salama, which means the mother of Salama, she became known as Ummul Mu'mineen the mother of all the believers, including yourself and myself, yourselves and myself, subhanallah. And she lived a beautiful life and she is known for many things. I will just mention one or two of them. One is whenever they saw any one of her children, again, similar to Asma binti Abi Bakr, they knew this is a child. It has to be of Umm Salama because she was known. She was like a school. Her children were disciplined, well looked after. They were brought up by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Umm Salama, uh, subhanallah, radiallahu anha. So during Hudaybiyah, she went with the Mu'mineen and the Prophet ﷺ. You know, the women used to go with the men at the time. And amazingly, the Prophet ﷺ, they struck a deal with the Kuffar of Quraysh and they were told, now we're going to go back. But they had come with their animals in order to make Umrah and they wanted to cut their animals at that time. They used to slaughter animals for Umrah as well. So what happened is they went back. They had to go back. But the Prophet ﷺ got up and told the people, his companions that, okay, since we have already made our intention for Umrah, each one of us, we have to sacrifice the animals we have and shave our hair and we're going back without the Umrah. And they were all saddened. No one moved. The Prophet ﷺ was looking at them. I've just issued an instruction and the companions have not yet moved. So he went into his little tent that he had and Umm Salama radiallahu anha was there. So the Prophet ﷺ was looking worried. She heard what had happened. She is the one who suggested to him. Imagine he's the Nabi of Allah. 
She said, O Messenger وسلم, I have an idea. What's the idea? Why don't you come out and you get shave your hair and sacrifice your animal? Or sacrifice your animal and shave the hair. That was the order. So if you do it without saying one word, they will follow. Subhanallah, he said, that's exactly what I will do. You know, today if you have to listen to your wife, people will start saying, ah, this man is, you know, he's this and he's that. Wallahi, nothing wrong at all. If she comes up with something better than myself or yourselves, Wallahi, you must take it. In fact, you would be wrong if you did not take it. Who said that a woman cannot, you know, come up with something better? Look at this. The wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa she gave an instruction. The whole army had followed. Subhanallah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he came out, he did not say one word, sacrificed his animal, looked at the, 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 one of the, the, them who was going to cut his hair, called him and said, you shave my head. And as that was happening, everyone started doing the same. So she looked and she was smiling and saying, didn't I tell you? Subhanallah. This was Umm Salama radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. She, she was a great woman. She had many students from amongst the Sahaba. She was the last from amongst the wives of Muhammad sallallahu to pass away. She passed away when she was 90 years old in the year 61 Hijrah, three years after Aisha radiallahu anha. So she narrated a lot of hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha used to be known as one of the faqihat al-sahaba. She had a lot of knowledge, knowledgeable from the sahaba, from the sahabiyat, the women. But Umm Salama, after the death of Aisha radiallahu anha, they used to come to her and ask her. And she also became known as one of them. And she had many students. They used to speak to the males also from behind the screen. It was something unique and amazing. And subhanallah, uh, she lived in Medina Munawwara. She passed away. She's buried in Baqi'ah. And as we said, she was the last from amongst the mothers of the believers to pass away. So just to quickly recap, Asma Abinti Abi Bakr was the last from amongst those who made hijrah to pass away. And Umm Salama radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen, who married Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was the last from amongst the wives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pass away in the year 63 Hijrah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us draw beautiful lessons. I'm sure you'll be able to draw even more lessons from these beautiful lives. May Allah grant them goodness, grant us all goodness, male and female from amongst us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.